All righty, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to day five of our lecture. I think this will be our last one if I can get the timing right today. Next, my. All right, so the first thing we'll talk about today is the Federal Reserve, also known as the Fed. The Fed is the central bank of the United States and it's tasked for controlling the money supply in order to control inflation rate and unemployment rates. Um, the Fed is also the lender of last resort for banks, so if banks can get the loans it needs, its very last resort is to borrow from the Fed. Um, the Fed was created in 1913 and consists of 12 regional banks, and there are seven governors that run on the board, and they serve 14-year terms. Um, the governors are appointed by the president and approved by the Senate. Monetary policy. The Fed conducts monetary policies and to change money supply, and that affects our aggregate market. We will talk about that in a later slide. Uh, so the first tool available for the Fed in terms of monetary policy are open market operations. And so you either buy or sell government securities. When you buy government bonds or government securities, you're increasing the money supply. And when you sell, you decrease the money supply. Um, whenever, the gov whenever the Fed does open market operations, it is determined by the, the Federal Open Market Committee or the FOMC. Um, the second tool available for the Fed to change the money supply is changing the discount rate. By lowering the discount rate, you increase the money supply, and by increasing the discount rate, you decrease the money supply. And lastly, the last tool for the Fed is to change the reserve requirements. Um, we talked about earlier how the reserve required ratio changes our money supply. So by increasing our reserve required, we decrease the money supply, and by decreasing that re required reserve, we increase our money supply. Um, and now we talk about the money market. So in the money market, you have a vertical money supply curve and a downward sloping money demand. The reason why money supply is vertical is because the Fed sets the amount of money in the market. The Fed isn't influenced by nominal interest rates. So it doesn't matter what the nominal interest rates are. If the Fed says this amount of money is in the economy, this amount of money will be in the economy. Uh, money demand, on the other hand, slopes downwards because as nominal interest rates increase, the opportunity cost of holding on to money, which is the interest earned from savings, that increases. So people will want to save instead of holding on to the money. And note that on the y-axis of your money market, you have nominal interest rate, and on the x-axis, you have quantity of money. So factors that shift the money supply curve is basically uh, monetary policy, right? You buy or sell government bonds, changing the discount rate or changing the required reserve ratio. Uh, factors that shift money demand is the price level. As the price level increases, people would demand more money to buy the goods that are on the market. Um, another factor that shifts money demand is real GDP. As real GDP increases, there are more goods and services to be bought in the market. So you will need more money to buy those goods and services. And finally, financial technology. Financial technology such as credit cards decrease our money demand because it allows us to not need to hold that much money. And ATMs increases our money demand. And now we talk about banks and the fractional reserve banking system. So remember that banks are financial intermediaries. Households save money in banks as deposits. And under fractional reserve banking, banks can actually loan out part of those deposits. And the total amount of deposits a bank can loan out is determined by the Fed through the required reserve ratio. Um, the problem with fractional reserve banking is that the bank doesn't have all of your money. So if you were to deposit or sorry, if you were to withdraw a big portion of your deposits, banks may not have that money on hand. And to make up for that, banks can either borrow through other banks or as a last resort through the Fed. 
banks' liabilities and assets. So under fractional reserve banking, a bank will have liabilities and assets. And all the bank's liabilities are basically the deposits it uh, receives. So for in, in this example, you have 100,000 in demand deposits. Um, and the assets for a bank is anything that the bank uses uses the deposits for. So for example, to buy government bonds or to make out loans. Um, note here that the reserves are basically any hard cash that the bank has. So this includes your reserve, required reserve ratio, which is the amount that the banks are required to hold on to. But this also includes any excess reserves, any part that the bank can still loan out but hasn't. And so if you look here in our example, there's the required reserve ratio is 10%. So your required reserve is 10K, and that means your excess reserve is 20K. And note that the value of your liabilities must equal the value of your assets. So how fractional reserve banking affect the money supply? Fractional reserve banking basically allows money to become more liquid. So that will shift money supply to the right. Note that you're not increasing wealth. And so if banks loan out all the deposits or all the excess reserves and loaners deposit all of that into their bank and so on, you can figure the change in money supply by using the formula one over the required reserve ratio, or basically one over RRR. And this is known as the money multiplier. And if there's currency drain, basically if people take out a certain amount, but don't deposit all of it into their bank, or if the banks keep a certain amount of excess reserves, then you use the formula down here, one plus currency drain divided by RRR plus currency drain. Now we talk about the quantity equation. The quantity equation basically equates money supply multiplied by the velocity of money to real GDP and price level. So MV equals YP. And some notes here are that the velocity of money is basically the average number of times a specific bill is changed. So basically how much transaction specific like piece of currency goes through. Um, and finally, something to note here is that real GDP times the price level is nominal GDP. So right, if you ever increase money supply, keep the, keep the velocity of money constant, then you have to have an increase in nominal GDP. And now we'll talk about the neutrality of money. So the neutrality of money basically says that in the long run, assuming that the velocity of money is constant, any change in money supply would change the price level. And the reason it doesn't change real GDP is because in the long run, what changes GDP are the factors of production. So land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship, technology. And so, yeah, we'll see basically how the neutrality of money works when we talk about the aggregate market. Inflation. So inflation basically occurs when the mon when the value of money decreases. It means everything gets more expensive because your money is now worth less. Um, and inflation is bad for our economy because it causes confusions on wages, interest rates, and pricing. Um, and so a few terms to note here in regards to inflation is disinflation. It's when the inflation rate slows but you still have inflation. And deflation is basically the opposite of inflation when prices all go down. All right, potential GDP. So potential GDP is the output of the economy when it's using its resources at its normal rates. At the potential GDP, it's also at its natural rate of unemployment. The natural rate of unemployment is when the unemployment without cyclical unemployment. So a key term here to remember is that at your natural rate of unemployment, you still have unemployment. It's just you don't have cyclical. Um, yeah, potential GDP can be increased or decreased by changing again your factors of production. So land, labor, capital, technology. And please note that 
just because it's a potential GDP, um, an economy can go above making its potential GDP. But when you do, usually you see signs of um, inflation and so forth, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, basically words are synonymous to potential GDP, uh, long run aggregate supply, potential output, um, natural rate of unemployment and full employment. And so now we talk about short run fluctuations or basically the business cycle. So short run fluctuations basically occur when the economy is not at its potential output. So you have, for example, recessions when your output is less than your potential GDP or expansions when your GDP is more than the potential. Um, and so short run fluctuations basically occur because of sticky prices and wages. And um, we'll see this again when we talk about the aggregate market. But basically prices don't change um, immediately when, when stuff happens. So you have an output gap. And I'll talk about output gap in a second. Um, so yeah, when there's a recession, there's a general decrease in activity. Uh, real GDP decreases, inflation decreases, and unemployment rates increase. When there's an expansion, there's an increase in economic activity. So you have a rise in inflation, a rise in real GDP, and a decrease in unemployment rates. Um, and so it's important to note here that the business cycle is basically the recurring alternations of recessions and expansions. And these are determined by the National Bureau of Economic Research or the NBER. And yeah, now we talk about the output gap. The output gap is basically the actual output and the difference between the potential output. Um, and you have an output gap when you have short run fluctuations, for example, recession or an expansion. And something important to note here about the output gap is Oaken's law. So Oaken's law basically says if there's a 1% change in unemployment, there's a 2% change in the output gap. And now we talk about our favorite aggregate market. So this is basically the market graph for our national economy. And the three factors or the three curves you see here are your aggregate demand, your long run aggregate supply, and your short run aggregate supply. And on your y axis, you have the price level, and the x axis, you have your real GDP. So, first, we'll start off by talking about aggregate demand. Aggregate demand is basically the sum of consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. And aggregate demand slopes downwards because of the wealth effects as price levels decrease people's buying power increases, so people will buy more goods and services. The interest rate effect, as price levels decrease, interest rates decrease, which means people will consume more because they save less. And finally, we have the foreign exchange effects. Basically, when domestic price levels decrease, um, exports will increase and imports will decrease. So basically, you increase your net exports. And you can shift to AD through increasing any of the components, consumption, investment, government spending, or net exports. And it can influence through monetary policy and fiscal policy. And now we talk about the short run aggregate supply. The short run aggregate supply is basically the total quantity of goods and services supplied in the national economy in the short run. And the SRAS slopes upwards because as price levels increase, assuming that resources and labor prices are all the same, it means firms will receive more profits. And if firms will receive more profits, they will increase their output. And so you can change SRS by say by changing potential GDP as as potential as potential GDP shifts to the right, SRAS will also shift to the right. Um, a change in nominal wage rates. If nominal wage rates increases, then SRAS will shift to the left. Um, by changing price of resources, such as oil or energy, if those go up, then again, the SRAS curve will shift to the left. Um, and you can also change SRAS through 
fiscal policy. This is known as supply side economics. So for example, would we'll be reducing business or yeah, reducing business tax credits, et cetera. And supply shocks can also shift short run aggregate supply. So supply shock could be like a drought, right? When a drought occurs, you have a lot less crops that will shift your aggregate supply to the left. And finally, we talk about the long run aggregate supply or basically your potential GDP. So again, as we mentioned before, the potential GDP is basically the production of our economy at normal levels. The long run aggregate supply curve is vertical because potential GDP is independent of price level. And you can change, again, the long run aggregate supply curve by changing any of the factors of production. Um, and also changing the full employment will also shift the LRAS. Uh, so how short run fluctuations affect the aggregate market? So basically, when we talk about short run fluctuations, we talk about recessions and expansions. And so these cause on, on the graph, you can see either a shift in your SRAS or your AD. And so when you have these short run fluctuations, you move away from your long run equilibrium. So here on the top left, we can see that the short run aggregate supply has shifted left. So from the long run equilibrium or compared to the long run equilibrium, you now have a lower real GDP and a higher price level. And so when this happens, we call it a stagflation, when you have lower real GDP and a higher inflation. And now down to the bottom left, when SRAS shifts to the right, you have more real GDP and a lower price level. I don't actually know if there's a term for when this happens, um, but if you guys do know, please let me know. And now on the top right, we see that the aggregate demand curve shifted to the left. So compared to the long run, now you have deflation or disinflation and a decrease in real GDP. And we call this a recessionary gap. And finally, for the last shift, you have AD shifting right. And so as you can see here, you have an increase in real GDP, but also an increase in inflation. And so when this happens, we call that an inflationary gap. So how are markets recover in the long run equilibrium? So there's actually two schools of economic thought on this. The first one, which is a fixed rule. Um, it basically argues that just keep everything the way it is. Eventually, the SRAS will shift back to recover from, to recover to equilibrium. And basically their thought is basically that wage rates will change based on the state of the economy. And when wage rates change, you shift the SRAS. So going back, right, to, to recover this, to recover from stagflation, basically fixed world policy would say that SRAS would shift back to where SRAS one was. Um, to recover again for the second, for the graph on the bottom left, SRAS would basically shift left until the curves all intersect at the long run aggregate supply. Um, when you look at a recessionary gap, basically fixed rule says the supply, the short run supply curve will shift to the right until the curves intersect at the long run. And same for an inflationary gap, except the supply curve will shift to the left. And the second school of thought on how aggregate markets can recover to equilibrium is known as the feedback rule, which is actually a pretty important topic in Keynesian economics. It basically states that government intervention would help bring back the economy to long run equilibrium. And this is done by shifting the AD. So going back to our four graphs, right on the top left, here the AD will shift to the right. And when you have on the bottom left, AD will shift to the left. And up here in a recessionary gap, the AD will basically return to its original position. And in an inflationary gap, the AD will shift left until it reaches its original position.
And now, using fiscal and monetary policy to stabilize the economy. So again, this is something uh, promoted by the Keynesian economics because having wage rates to change to shift your SRS sometimes can take too long. And when that happens, you don't want to have a period of a prolonged uh, recession where there's bad unemployment or you don't want periods with prolonged inflation. Both are bad for our economy. Um, and so note here that both fiscal and monetary policy can shift the aggregate demand curve. So that's how um, Keynesian economics believe the market should recover. Um, fiscal policy is basically when the government changes its spending or its taxes. And when applying fiscal policy, there are a few multipliers you can use to find the total change in um, aggregate demand based on your change in government spending or government taxes. You wouldn't learn this in uh, USAD economics, so I didn't provide those formulas there, but if you're interested, feel free to ask me. And monetary policy, basically is the Fed changing the money supply through open market operations, changing the discount rate, or changing the required reserve ratio. And so arguments against government interventions in the economy, basically your fixed, fixed world people. Um, so basically arguments are that potential GDP can be hard to calculate. And sometimes economic data can take a long time to acquire. So by the time you implement these government policies, you might overcorrect or you might just correct or you might just um, aim at a level that's different from where the economy naturally is. And so when that happens, you obviously have drastic results because you don't want the economy. For example, if you're in a recession, you don't want to shoot the economy past equilibrium and go into an inflationary gap because you went from um, high unemployment to high inflation. Um, and another weakness of fiscal policy is because Congress takes years to pass anything Sometimes fiscal policy can take a really long time before they are passed and then more time before the effects come into play. So sometimes, again, that can lead to overcorrection. And that's basically the end of day five. Do you guys have any questions, comments, or suggestions? No, sounds good. Oh yeah, thank you guys for attending all five days of the lecture. I hope this presentation has <laughs> Yeah, I hope the presentation and the lectures have helped a lot in your understanding of uh, economics. If you see anything wrong with my presentation or if you have any questions about econ in general, feel free to reach out to me. And yeah, I will provide the link to this presentation and to the videos on Google Classroom. Or if you're on Zoom, I will provide it to you through Discord. Otherwise than that, thank you guys for attending, and this will be the end of my five-day lecture for Akadek Econ. Thank you. Yep, have a great day.